Welcome to the She Build Show. I'm your host, Stephanie Olson, a licensed general contractor who builds new construction, renovates, and designs your vision. Today, more than ever, we need raw, authentic women who are willing to rise above society's norms, break those glass ceilings, and encourage each other to boldly build the life we were meant to live. So honey, what are you building? Welcome to the She Build Show. Today, I have Morgan, who is a phenomenal DIYer, and I am so excited to have you on the show. Welcome. Hi, thank you. Yes. So tell me about your background. All I can see right now is this awesome green bookshelf in the background (laughs) that I'm like, girl, did you do that yourself? Yeah. So it's like you can kind of see my crazy mess of renovation on one side and the other side, it's this like really nicely completed library space, which I had to pre-film a little bit for a brand and I will be revealing it in like two weeks. So the timing of this will be perfect. Um, But yes, I have beautifully finished library on one side and then unfinished renovation chaos on the other. (laughs) That is is pretty much my life these days. Yeah. It's like a perfect (laughs) combination. Okay. So tell me. Craziness. Yeah, exactly. I feel like that's every, you know, anybody that like likes to do anything with their hands. There's never a part that you can hide that's not chaotic. (laughs) So tell me, like, I just want to know, because I was reading about you a little bit, right? And I know you, like, you're an architect, correct? And mm-hmm. so tell me, I just yeah. want to know a little bit about, you know, your story and kind of how you got to where you're at today. Share with me. Yeah, absolutely. So I am originally from Arizona. I grew up there and around maybe like second or third grade, I had somebody ask me what I wanted to be when I grew up. And I was like, an artist because I really liked drawing and somebody was like what kind of artist and I was like what do you mean and they kind of broke down well there are lots of different types of artists there are people that draw and paint they can also like build sculptures or design like buildings and furniture and stuff like that and I was like wow designing buildings sounds so cool it's just like the biggest art form it's, Mm -hmm. it's a habitable piece of art and I always found that extremely fascinating I ended up moving to Georgia to go to Georgia Tech for their architecture program. And I went all the way through my undergraduate and master's. I had always wanted to be an architect. And I was like, I'm here. I'm just going to knock it out and do it. And then I entered the field. And I feel like there is this huge rift between the expectations sort of built up in school. Everyone's like, it's going to be hard, yada, yada, right? Mm -hmm. But then you know it's going to be hard. And I get into the industry and it is hard, sure, but I expected that. What I didn't expect was the lack of creativity I was experiencing from day one. I was working at an architecture firm in Atlanta and I was working on office towers, convention centers, and the stadium. And I loved it. I thought it was really cool, but I was a small cog in a big machine. I had ownership of this little itty bitty piece over here. Somebody else had a little bitty piece over here. And then there were other people higher up that kind of tied it all together. But I had one principal say to one of my coworkers who was like, I'm hoping like I can get a little more creative. Can I like work on this other part of the project? He was like, oh, but there's so much creativity in designing how this curb detail looks. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, have a nice day. (laughs) And we were like, oh, okay, that's the difference. In school, you're sort of given this program, all right. Let's yeah, sit start down from scratch of, and yeah, create, whole, the whole yeah. semester. You're just like, well, what if we did this? What if we did this? And you're working under like the rules of what your teacher sort of set out, but you have so much creative freedom. And then for years and years and years, you're just designing curb details. So <laughs> architects don't really peak until they're in their 50s or 60s. And it's not like I wasn't patient, but I was lacking that passion that I had in school, the excitement to design. And so I started just kind of like doing some of my own interior styling stuff with my roommate and we were just posting on Instagram and we thought it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of work, but it was a lot of fun. And then work got busy again. So of course that kind of petered out. But when I noticed layoffs were impending, Mm. I started exploring the idea of doing some freelance work or renovating my boyfriend's house at the time. And that's where I am now. I got laid (laughs) off and... I decided to go in full steam ahead and renovate my house and teach people what I know about architecture and what I know about design. Okay. So 
that you know you say that so simply and you know <laughs> nicely but i know that's a lot of bs <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot uh, of work behind it yes. <laughs> yeah so i want to know like the nitty gritty details of why did you think that you could diy and why was that your focus and why like i want to know why and how <laughs> you you know just really started cuz you know you have a pretty big following now on instagram and it seems like you're, you know, really teaching people how to DIY and doing your projects at home, which I know is a lot of work, you know, doing them, filming them. I don't know if you're editing them and, you know, posting everything. So <laughs> all the things, why, like, did it just kind of like evolve into this or did it like, no, this is what I'm going to do. And you had a really clear picture I think... or were you just like, crap, I got laid off. <laughs> I, think, I think DIY was the direction I kind of wanted to head in anyways. And before the layoff earlier in the year, I was going to be moving into my boyfriend's house. He is my fiance now, which is very exciting. But you we, want to move over with your building I skills. Do. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually pretty sure in his like Tinder bio, he said something about like, it'd be great if like you knew how to do tile or whatever. <laughs> and I was like, I do. I'm your girl. I'm your girl. Is that how you met him on Tinder? <laughs> Yeah, I did. Oh, that's so funny. That's really um, like oddly was, specific. Right? <laughs> but the house was so outdated. And me like being a designer and you're like really interested in design. Like I felt like I needed something that looked nice to live in. And it was so stuck in 1989. And he was like, I want to renovate this house. I'm going to renovate this house. But he hadn't started doing it yet. And I was like, okay, well, Let's this house it. is, I don't want to move into this house as it is right now. So we started with the bedroom which it's a five bedroom house, which is, was huge for him as one person to be living. And it was his grandparents' house and he was set up in one of the rooms. So we're like, okay, we'll set up this other room as the main bedroom and we will put in new floors. We'll paint the walls and remove that wallpaper border and just like start getting it to where it looks like a space that I can, that feels like I live here too. Yeah. It's not just sort of this older house. So we started with that and I was like, we have a lot of work to do and we can't <laughs> afford to hire somebody to do it all. So it was more of like a necessary evolution of the house. In order to renovate the house, I had to do it myself or he had to do it. And I had kind of grown up with a really good role model. My mom was sort of the same way. She wanted the house of her dreams. She wanted her house to be a great space for her family to grow up in. And so she made that happen. And she would tile the floors, paint the walls. She would always be the one that was DIYing and making the space good for us. So I kind of like grew up under that sort of like, yeah, I mean, we need to put tile in the bathroom because the bathroom is broken. So I will do it. Hiring out was never the first thought. It was never like, oh, I can't afford to hire it out. It was like, oh, how much would it cost for us to tile it? Right. Even though I don't know how to tile. (laughs) <laughs> most people be like I've yeah. done it a couple times but I'm not really sure I truly know the best way either <laughs> right it's all trial and error and trying different things and uh you so know what was your first really so it. the first project was the bedroom that's pretty easy right yes Paint I wouldn't floor. even say it's completely done it was just stripped of the 1989 Stop. aesthetic <laughs> yeah and so then you were like okay Obviously, you didn't have a job at this point. So who was supporting, like your boyfriend was supporting you guys financially while you're filming this stuff? And does it feel like scary and terrifying because you're not making a dollar? And like, what's happening in your brain? (laughs) It was like a little bit of both. So I actually, right before I got laid off, I had set myself up in a really good financial position. I had paid off all my debts and I had saved up my goal and savings. And then like the next day, it was like, sorry, bye. (laughs) Uh, Oh my God. And I was like, okay, this sucks, but I feel at least somewhat prepared, right? And so I had a little bit of my own stuff to live off of, but my sort of contribution to the rent decreased. We had a roommate at the time living in the upstairs space. So the the cost of the, the mortgage was, my contribution was much lower than previously. He started covering more of the groceries. So he wasn't fully supporting me, but he was supporting me enough that he wasn't crippling himself financially and that I could still move forward with projects. So... Most of my savings went towards purchasing supplies for various projects. And because I didn't want to kind of like sit twiddling my thumbs for long, I contacted various people and I actually got in touch with an interior designer who needed 3D modeling and like architectural drafting services. Mm -hmm. And so I worked for her for, for many, many months 
doing projects. I mean, I wasn't making a ton of money doing it, but it was certainly helping me keep afloat. Right. And And I've actually been very fortunate to get a few sponsorships pretty early on. Okay. Um, Tell me about that. I attended the Haven Conference in 2020. So right before I got laid off, actually. What is that? So it's a conference for DIYers and designers. It's called the Haven Conference. Where is it at? It's always in Atlanta. They actually talked about moving it next year, but they're going to keep it in Atlanta this year. But eventually it might end up in Nashville. There's a lot of brands that come to this, a lot of DIY and design creators. It was originally for bloggers. And so there's a huge blogging culture there that, I mean, you can find anyone that will teach you about anything you need to know about blogging and building wow, websites. Wow, I've never even like, heard of this. That. It's such a good resource. So is it like a huge thing? Like a bunch of people go or it's like only the, you know, I think underground so. people? I, and there, there are often more than just DIY people there, but... In my experience, it's mostly the DIY niche. And there's a good amount of attendance there. Wow. And so who was like your first sponsor? How did you get that? So Home Depot is one of the main sponsors at the Haven Conference. And they have a competition every year called Orange Tank. And they basically put out a pitch, like submit your ideas for this type of project. And there are different categories for different like monetary levels. Like we will give you money to complete this project sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And so I entered that. And I didn't win. That's okay. <laughs> the connections that I made, it was virtual this year because it was 2020, but I still okay. managed to make some connections. I kept up with the people that were in my emails. And I was like, if I'm going to make this thing work, like I really need to get into it. And so every couple of months, I would just sort of email a couple of the people that I had connected with. And I eventually got my first paid collaboration with the Home Depot spring of that next year. So less than a year later. If, wow. I mean, it wasn't enough to, I mean, retire. If, I, had my, if I still had my job, it wasn't enough to quit my job, but it was right. certainly enough to be like, wow, I can do this. And at the time I only had like 1400 followers. Okay. And I was like, wow. Okay. Wow. I'm that's awesome. Do, yeah. If I can make this little chunk of change at 1400 followers, like what happens if I continue pushing and making more projects and brands are like, Hey, we would love to see you promote our product. Maybe I could actually turn this into a full-time thing. Mm -hmm. So what was the project that you did to like submit to that? What was it called? The orange something? The orange tank. Yeah. So it's sort of like shark tank, but orange because Home Depot. Got it, got it. (laughs) I submitted a deck, which I'm actually glad that I didn't win because it's the amount of Let's see how how do I word this? <laughs> like an outside um, deck, like a physical deck. Is that physical what you mean? deck. Yeah, okay. I would have to get a permit for it. It would involve a lot of labor, and it would take me a good chunk of time to actually complete it. So it was not um, something that you were doing. It was like you're pitching. I was. I would do this. I for couldn't you guys. do okay. it without the funding. This was sort of like the the pitch that year was sort of like what's a dream project that you would want to do. And I was got like, it. Got it. Okay. This is it. This is the breakdown of how much it would cost. It fit within one of these categories. I think realistically, it wouldn't have fit completely in that category, like maybe the base materials, but the labor associated with it, like I'm kind of relieved that I didn't end up having to do that. <laughs> this would have been really... You were like, uh, a lot of not work. all I got was a deck. <laughs> yeah, it would have been a lot of work for not any pay. I mean, you'd get the money to build the deck, but when you're spending four yeah, all your time weeks working yeah. on a project, all your time and you're not really getting paid for it, you just got material. Like I can't pay for groceries with... A two by four. Right. Darn it. Maybe these days. Yeah, I was going to say, maybe you go sell it on the street and get some groceries. <laughs> hey, I'll trade you this for some bananas. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, what was your second sponsor? Like, how did, okay, so you did that. And it sounds like you really went after it, like mm-hmm. touching base with people, being that like annoying. I always like relate that to like back in the day when I wanted to get a job, like the first job I ever wanted, I got, I wanted to work at this restaurant. It was called Logan's Roadhouse. I don't know if they have them out there. And I literally like walk. I mean, I was probably 16 at the time and I would go in every week. Like, hi, my name's Stephanie. Do you remember me? Yes, I want a job. And like out of just like sheer annoyance, they gave me the job. (laughs) Determination. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I'm like, I'm here again, you know. And yeah. so but just like, like remember a little me. bit of that. Yeah. Remember me? Remember? Mm-hmm. I don't like, I think people forget that, that it's like, it takes yeah. hard work and it takes like putting your face in front of people because there's so many faces online and so many people doing things that, you know, just even that like super low level, like 
reaching out, I think people forget that it's not like people just get discovered and it's a miracle. Like, no, you've been working hard to make this happen. And in the content creation world, if you're pitching an idea to somebody, they might not like that idea, but they might have something else that you'd be a good fit for. Or they don't have anything right now, but then you email again in two months and you're like, hey, I would love to work with you. Here's another idea of a project that I have coming up. I think you'd be a great fit for it. And then this is how I got my first paid sponsorship because they responded to that email. And actually, she didn't acknowledge what I said in my previous email at all. She just paid me to ship that project. <laughs> and I was like, sure I, I do. Thinking, I know. I was like, I was like, technically, no, I don't have a ship lock project. I actually don't really want to put ship lock in my house, but maybe I can do it in a way. It's like, yeah, no, yes, I do. I can make yeah. one. I can make a project that will be perfect. So that's what I did. I ended up doing a ship lock project. So. And that was that with Home Depot or was that who was, was that with? That was with Home Depot again. So is that like your main sponsor still? Like doing yes. projects for them? Yeah, wow, that's, this is, so that's cool. what this library is actually. For Home Depot. Home Depot. How does it even freaking work? Like my mind just like, I don't get the internet or the interweb or the social media. Like, you know, I'm old. And okay. <laughs> so like, so how does it work for you to, you know, they say we want this project or you're presenting it? Like, how does it? And like, obviously I know they want the content. But yeah, so it depends. Sometimes they have campaigns that some of their like Home Depot is an umbrella and under the umbrella, there are lots of other brands that Home Depot sells products for. And so sometimes there will be sponsored campaigns through like a specific stain company or uh, a ladder company. And so sometimes Home Depot will be looking for two campaigns like that. But ultimately, if you take social media out of it, right, uh, you have a company that has to produce photos or videos to share on like commercials, magazines, in promos. Yeah. And even just like yeah. little brochures and stuff like that. They need to have images and stuff like that. And so typically, if you take social media out of it, there are people that they have to hire, right? Photographers, set designers, a space to even set up a set, uh, videographers, editors, just they have so many people and the space and the materials and all that that they have to pay for to create four photos that they might use in a summer catalog or on their website or in a little like promo holding up sponges in an aisle. You know, right. all of those require staging and photography and and all of that. Now brands are really loving social media because yeah, a lot of they don't people, have to do all that. <laughs> they don't have to do all of that because you have in a content creator a photographer a set, a videographer, a lighting designer, a stylist. They are basically doing an all-in-one situation and they're actually getting a really good deal for it because a lot of people aren't paying and just doing things for product. And so they are making the best deal that they've ever had. Yeah, they're, they're <laughs> getting the sweet marketing. into the deal. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah, but I mean, as you grow and you can kind of like figure out what I can, like I'm improving my photography skills here. I'm improving the ability to like teach people how to do certain things there. And so when it comes to pitching ideas to Home Depot, like I will shoot them an email with my ideas. And sometimes they'll be like, that actually matches up perfectly with a painting campaign that we have coming up. Would you be interested in like using that project for this campaign that we are having with Bear? Or they'll reach out to me and just be like, hey, we have a campaign coming up. You might be a great fit. Do you have a project involving stain coming up that you would be interested in? in working with us on. And typically the answer is going to be yes. Yeah. <laughs> I will make course. one. <laughs> I will make one. Yeah. I'm still absolutely. growing and I'm still like trying to earn an income. And so, yes, absolutely. I will create a same project for you. So how long, to, like, give me a little bit of timeline. How long have you just been like working at this, you know, from like, okay, you went from that 1400 followers. Now you're like over 15, right? 15, I'm just under 15. Just under 15. So how long has it been? So I started in 2020. Okay. So it's a couple of years. At so this. About, about two years. And I feel like social media is constantly evolving. And so you constantly have to keep up with how the algorithm works and all that. And so I was at 5,000 up until earlier this year, this spring or June, actually. Oh, wow. It's just kind um, of grew yeah, in the last Instagram, couple of months. Yeah. Instagram has been putting a lot of emphasis into reels. And so unfortunately, the only way to grow is to post reels these days. Whereas I still love the curated photographs oh, yeah. of interior spaces and progress images. And it's hard to be like, hey, like, yes, I worked on this really cool space. Let me show you. And then it just like jumps into a video. But 
So did you just like put your focus all on reels in the last couple of months? Is that what you did? <laughs> yeah, 100% reels. And that has helped with growth. Do you have it's, anybody helping you? besides um, your Occasionally my friend? fiance will help me lift something, but when it comes to... But like, to so you're filming, blog, you're, yeah. so you're blogging also? Well, I had to kind of figure out what my priorities were. Yeah. I got yeah. to this point where I was like, I was told I needed a blog. I was told I needed a Pinterest and a Twitter and a Facebook. And it was just sort of like, okay, well, if that's what I need. And so I just sort of like started all of these things. I don't keep the blog up regularly. I'm not posting like every Tuesday and Thursdays, Mm -hmm. but I have content over there. And for my bigger projects, like I had a lot of questions about this coffered ceiling that I did in my entry and an epoxy tabletop or a countertop that I worked on. Now those, I got a ton, a ton of questions about how did you do this? I love how you did that. Can you please talk about more about how you connected these together? And so I will then turn something like that into a blog post because that is a great way to share more details and more information that people can always refer back to. But I don't keep it up because at a certain point, you're just running yourself too thin. Right. So you got to kind of put your energy where you're either most passionate about or where you can see the most return on your efforts. Mm-hmm. And blogging is a long-term game. Right. Yeah. Over time. So you really been focusing on creating reels and you've seen your con, you know, I mean, I think figuring out Instagram and the algorithm is like learning Chinese. I don't think it's an yeah, easy it's thing to changing. do. Yeah. And I don't think it's an easy thing to do. And I think the fact that you're doing it by yourself, like what do you think has made it so that like you're able to do that because like you're doing the projects, filming the content, editing the videos, posting the reels and getting sponsorships. And you're doing all of that by yourself. Are you working more now or less than when you had your job? (laughs) Definitely more. (laughs) I'm definitely working more than I did at my full-time job. And it was funny because while I was at that full-time job, I would constantly complain to my friends or my fiance and just that we're being paid salary. There's no option to get paid for overtime or for deadlines. There's no option for increased compensation for that. And I would just complain about they want us to work 60 hours a week or 50 hours a week, just depending on the project. And then if we worked a 70 hour week, at most, they'd be like, congratulations, we bought pizza for you. To have lunch. And it was like, I just worked two weeks in a one week period. Like, what are you talking about? But now I don't really have weekends. My evenings aren't truly mine anymore either. But I still have to say that at the end of the day, I'm so much happier. Yes, I'm still stressed, but it's not the same kind of stress. It's more like there's a difference between like being stressed because you're going to be disappointing somebody or falling short for somebody else's expectations. But then when it's your own expectations, like, yeah, I'm disappointed if I don't do something that I really wanted to do by a certain time. But it's a different kind of stress than letting somebody else down. Because it's kind of your own deadlines, right? Yeah. So it's like, if I fail my own deadlines, that's a failure to myself. And that's just something that I can work on for me. But if I fail, like when I was working in a corporate architecture firm, when I fail one of those deadlines, like that that had much bigger sort of consequences. (laughs) It affected a lot more people. So, and yes, there are still deadlines with brands and stuff, but I find that they can be flexible sometimes. And I find that like my own drive has been getting better over time, but I'm definitely happier, even though I'm working consistently more. Yeah. I enjoy the work more. Did you just like on a, you know, like personal, you know, put your life on the internet type feeling? Are you like typically that type of person that like is like an open book and happy? Because I imagine like, you know, I know, you know, sharing stories and letting people know what's going on and like, is your phone always out? Is there like, how are you feeling about all of that? <laughs> Weirdly enough, I still feel like I don't have my phone out nearly as much as my fiance. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> it's just constantly scrolling. In, in terms of sharing my life on the internet, I don't very much. It's still something I'm struggling with. It's like, how much do I want to share? How much is too much? When, like, at, at a certain point, do I just want to be an escape for people where? Regardless of what's going on in the world, I am just sharing a little slice of something different, something light, or do I share my opinions and share what's happening in my life and my highs and lows? There's a balance that needs to be figured out. 
I need to figure out how vulnerable I want to be. I don't want to bring people down. I want it to be a positive space, but I also need, I'm a human being, right? Right, So uh, I'm still trying to figure out that balance for myself. I've been sharing some things that are like wedding planning related, but those are all, of course, like more light. Yeah. The the saddest sort of thing I think I ever shared was when I got laid off when I was, had my thousand followers and I was like, oh, so I got laid off. (laughs) like how do you share that information without people being like oh no another layoff in covid like yeah so there's right it's a weird balance do you feel like it's a community for you yes so you kind of have to make it a community for yourself depending on what you need so i felt that i was lacking coworkers because i really loved that camaraderie i got when i went into the office and i was sitting next to one of my friends and i just like chit chat with her occasionally. And then I would do work and I'd chat with somebody else I was sitting across from. And I liked that sort of that environment. And you lose that when suddenly you're at home all the time, fully remote with, I mean, you don't have coworkers. So your coworkers tend to be other creators. And I think a lot of the community that creators develop is amongst other creators. Like these, Mm -hmm. these are my coworkers. And so I actually have a weekly call. I had mine this morning. We'll just get on this call and just what are your like the next week or the next quarter? Like, what are your, some of your business goals? What are some ways that you are thinking about getting money? What are some brands that you're reaching out to? And we'll ask for tips and tricks. Hey, I'm thinking about reaching out to this brand. Do you have any advice? And we'll have about this hour, hour and a half conversation that just allows us to connect with somebody else, mm-hmm, but then beautiful. also allows us to learn and grow a little bit because we each bring something new and different to the table. And they're all like DIYers. Yeah. So this specific group is DIYers. Wires. One has a background in marketing. She's still working full time. Another used to be a teacher, but just started doing content creation full time. And then I have a design background uh, and I'm doing it full time. So we all kind of contribute a little bit to the conversation. How did you meet them or how did that group get going for you? Probably from the Haven Conference. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, I think I connected with other accounts that were in a similar following size as I was so that we could kind of attempt to grow and learn together. And then we've just stayed in touch over the last couple of years. That's awesome. That's so cool. So I know you also like offer interior design Mm -hmm. for clients virtually, right? Yes. So that's something that I started doing pretty quickly after. I try not to take on too many clients because I do really enjoy my content creation side, but there has still been a good amount of projects I've enjoyed being a part of. And I don't typically have people using my services all the way through construction. But my favorite part is sort of like coming up with the designs and 3D modeling it and putting it together and like presenting it. And that's mostly what I've been doing. I've worked on a couple of kitchens that I thought were really cool. <laughs> that's awesome. So when you do a project on your own, are you going in and you're fully designing it and 3D modeling it before you, like, you started your bookshelf or whatever it is? Are you still using like your software and your skills there? Yeah, do I do that for all my own projects. I have a 3D model of this library that I worked on. There's still some unfinished parts, but I know exactly what it'll look like because I have it all <laughs> modeled out. Uh-huh. And even if the model isn't exactly perfect, the model actually comes in handy and not only for figuring out dimensions for shelving and stuff like that, but it also comes in handy for pitching myself to brands. Right. Like, if hey, I, I can create this if you want to Yeah. Help. Like right. if there's a rug brand that I really love, they're like, oh, I'd love to work with this brand. I'm such... And at the time, it was like, I was such a small creator. What can I do to show them that I will create good content for them to use to market their products? Regardless of whether or not I'm sharing with my audience, a lot of brands will want things to share with theirs. And so how can I convince them that I can give them something good? Yeah. And so I would send them like little snapshots of the 3D model and be like, and I love photoshopping their products into the space. I'm like, look how great your rug would look in this beautiful <laughs> space. And I actually had a brand get back to me. And although I was below the threshold of following count that they would typically work with, they were like, we have never seen anybody pitch a project to us with our product, like superimposed into their space. And I got the project because of it. Yeah, girl. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, using, I'm using those skills. skills. That I, I, yeah. I, I went to school for a long time to get some of those skills. Right. So. Yeah. Right. <laughs> they better pay off at some point. So I better still be using them. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that that's awesome to also like 
you know, just organize your thoughts and and right. have a plan. And it also really comes in handy for convincing my fiance that this project is a good idea. Yeah, because then you can see what's in your head. Because I'm always yeah. like, just trust me and shut up. Yeah, <laughs> I'll be like, what, if, what if we do this? And he's like, that sounds like a lot of work. I'm like, first of all, you're not doing the work. Yeah, first of all, just say yeah. <laughs> I'm the one doing it. But it's technically his house, right? right? So it's like, we both live here. Like he needs to also yeah, like the project I'm going to put in here. So if I can take those spaces, create them and show them to him, then he's on board. This would look, yeah. uh, he's a little bit more likely to get on board more quickly. And then you're like, convincing time. And then you're like, yeah, I already signed the contract. So yeah, so it's <laughs> happening. <laughs> but this is what it'll look like. Yeah, that's <laughs> funny. That's too funny. So would you say... Like, I'm just curious, you know, it's been two years since you quit your job. I'm just, you know, want to try to, in terms of the audience, if they're curious, if you're okay with sharing this, Mm -hmm. in terms of like the money you were making in your, you know, architect job, is that comparable to what's happening now? Is there any sort of consistency or is it always like, okay, I've got to come up with another brand deal, more content? What's that like for you? So I am not quite close to what I was making at my previous job, which I feel like a lot of people think that architects make a lot of money and they do. If you have been working for 30, 40 years, you have that experience to back you. And I didn't have that with my five years of experience. (laughs) I was still getting paid intern level dollars. (laughs) But now I still don't make that amount of money. I uh, probably put more money into my business than I should when I really should be leaning in more on brand deals. But sometimes I just... No, it's a, it, you know what it's about? It's like being an entrepreneur and going after yes. your stuff is there is a period of time where you don't have a choice but to put the money back into your yeah. business and to and grow it and to bet on yourself. And, and that's I, still where I'm at. <laughs> yeah, and that's totally an okay place to be. And I think the problem and the reason why a lot of people don't make it is because they feel that and then they quit, you know? And I, I a lot always, of it is endurance. Yeah, and I say it this way, that you have to have a reason that is called your no matter what reason. And mm-hmm. I always try to come up with like, okay, what is the one reason? I always write it down. What is the one reason that I would be okay quitting? And unless that thing happens, like I always say that, you know, like say you want to do 75 hard, just for example, like, you know what that is, the work, it's like a 75 days of two workouts a day, you eat, you have to pick an eating plan, you read 10 pages, and it's like, you have to commit or you fail. And, you know, and before you start something like that, you're like, okay, the one reason I would be okay quitting is like, if I broke a bone. You know, like that's the only reason I would be okay quitting, you know, and it, or if like somebody's in the hospital and I can't, you know, like those are the reasons I would be, everything else is, you know, it's no matter what I'm doing it, no matter what. And so I think we need that in our businesses, right? That like, we need, I'm okay quitting. I'm okay throwing in the towel. If this thing happens, you know, like if it all goes up in flames or whatever it is. And so you have an out if that thing happens and you feel okay with it, but most likely that thing's not going to happen. Right. Right. And and then, so then all the things that do come up that feel like you should quit. It's like, well, no, it's not that one thing. So I've got to solve it and I've got to move on and I've got to keep going. And so it's just always that mindset. I really think like the entrepreneur's work is like a mindset work because it's like this thing comes up and this problem happens or I'm not where I wanted to be. And it's like, nobody whoever got anywhere got there in six months, you know, or a year, you know, it's like people see success after 10. And so keep going. Yeah. No yeah. matter what. <laughs> it's definitely a long game. It's definitely a lot of endurance. And I think a lot of convincing for me is that if I don't succeed, I have to go back to that job or a job like that. And there might be like other areas of the industry that I could fit well into, but I just... I just that scares you more it. than not. It scares me more. <laughs> it really does. Yeah. And I think my like one caveat is if something happened to Taylor, my fiance, and he couldn't work anymore, right? That would be absolutely. I'm done. I'm gonna go get a job yeah. that will support us. Me. Yeah. But I also see so many large creators that are extremely transparent about their income and how it has increased as they've grown and. Next year, I could do the same as last year where I didn't make enough to be taxed. (laughs) It's okay. Or next year, I 
could make two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars. Like, right? I really won't know. I won't know until I'm in it, until I see where my growth is, or until I reach out to a bunch of brands. Like, I won't know until I'm in it. And so it's so hard for me to be like, well, if this doesn't work out in like two more months, I'm gonna have to end it. I can't do that because I also know that in three months it could be different. It could really turn around for me. Mm-hmm. So it's sort of like. I don't know, you've probably seen that like little cartoon image where there's these two people digging underground looking for diamonds and one guy gave up and turned around and he was like Uh so close. And then the other person that kept going found it. And it was sort of like this, if I just go a little bit further, if I just like keep pushing myself and keep teaching people about what I know and teach how to do different projects and things like that, eventually I will get to a point where I can keep teaching people about design and DIY without having to worry nearly as much about whether or not I have to go back to my old job. (laughs) Girl, just go all in. Let's go. Come on. Don't even think about that. Yeah. So I think that's pretty much in the rear view mirror for me right now. I just, it's just. No, it's hard. Yeah. And it's hard to trust yourself, but I think it really is. It's like the thoughts that we think and we, you know, okay, well, I have a backup plan. And I think that that's like, okay, if Tyler's not okay, that's my no matter what. Every other reason, every other thing that comes up in my brain is not a sufficient reason. Is Tyler still alive and he's working? Yes. Okay, let's <laughs> All right, go. All right, we're good. <laughs> yeah, let's go. That's the only reason. I can yeah. quit and he's he's fine. You you hurting? Are you not feeling well? Okay. <laughs> All right, well then we're going to keep going. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I think that you're doing a phenomenal job and your content is beautiful. And I think that you should absolutely keep going. And I think, you know, learning as you're going and doing it, you know, by yourself and not having a background in technology or, you know, video editing or even knowing, you know, how to build anything. I think your bookshelf behind you looks incredible and your craftsmanship is gorgeous. And it's such a pleasure to meet you and to learn about what you've done because it's just something I don't know anything about. (laughs) (laughs) Well, at some point, I think one of my like big goals is to be able to purchase houses. And I don't necessarily want to like be a flipper because I Mm -hmm. feel like flippers have a really negative connotation, cheap, quickly done. But I see so many poorly done jobs Mm -hmm. that I want to be the one that actually does it right. Yeah, absolutely, girl. I want to be the one that gets in there. And even if it costs a little bit more, I want it to actually be good for whoever ends up purchasing it. Or if I decide to rent it or whatever. It's almost like I want to like improve the name of the industry like change the reputation and like I don't want these cheap flippers the cheapest materials things not being done correctly like I want to do it right because I want people to have nice spaces to live in absolutely and I think that that should keep propelling you and I think that that's a big reason why I'm in what I do because you know there's a negative connotation towards contractors you know just in Mm -hmm. general and you know and I flipped I've probably flipped over 100 houses and that was always my, I'm like, I will never polish a turd. Like, that's just like, <laughs> I'm not okay with that. And I never mm-hmm. did. You know, I can say 100% that I never did that. And there's absolutely... Thank you there's, for being one of the good ones. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. And it was like, and when I would sell my flips, I would be like, I live here. Here's my phone number. If anything goes wrong, call me. I had people call me like one, I think out of the hundred, maybe one person called me. And she was like, my bathroom's not working, you know, like, or something's going on with the tub. And I didn't touch it. I didn't have anything to do with it. And I replaced the whole thing for her because if she was going to shame me or put my, you know, a bad reputation out there that that I did something, I was like, it's worth $5,000 to me to make sure she's happy that I, you know, whether I touched it or not. So I totally get that. And I know you'll get there. Absolutely. We need more people like you. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) Absolutely. Okay. So Tell the people where they can find you, follow you, hire you, all that. So you can find me at Palmetto Highway, pretty much anywhere. Uh, my blog is palmettohighway.com. Why is my it email. called that? I'm like, what so, the heck is this? Uh, when I was coming up with the name, I didn't want something that like, I felt weird about putting my name in something. And I wanted it to be able to like be whatever I needed my business to be. And it's actually part of the name of the road that we live on. So it's not, <laughs> even, it's not that creative. But I liked the sound of it. I liked that it sounded fast paced because of highway. And I liked that it sounded Southern because we live in Georgia. So I was like, all right, Palmetto Highway. Like, I feel like that could really work. It's super cute. And it just, I don't know. I hope that in the future, when I look back on my business and back on our first home together, 
with my future husband, I hope that we look back at the name Palmetto Highway and it holds a lot of nostalgia for us. So yeah, that's gorgeous. That's I love why it. I chose, so... chose it. <laughs> <laughs> I know. But yeah. So I'm on Palmetto Highway everywhere. My blog and Instagram mostly is where I'm at. I'm also on TikTok, which my TikTok following is actually catching up to my Instagram following. TikTok oh, is yeah. definitely growing. But I'm people keep telling me and I'm like, you're like, ooh, ooh, I can't do it. I know I'm so old. <laughs> I'm starting to create like TikTok exclusive content. So just things that I'll share on TikTok that maybe the people on Instagram wouldn't be as interested at. But those are where I'm at most often is okay, cool. Instagram and TikTok. All right, Palmetto Highway. Well, thank you so much, Morgan. I have loved every minute of this. Thank you for having me. Of course. Thanks for joining me today on the She Build Show. My name is Stephanie Olson. My hope is that this episode leaves you feeling empowered and ready to boldly take that step into building the life that you envision, one two by four at a time. And if you can do me a quick favor, please leave me a five-star review on iTunes. I get giddy over reading the reviews each week, and I will choose one special person to win some SheBuild swag. Make sure you add your name to the review, and I'll reach out if you're the winner. Thanks again for hanging out. Be sure to visit me at theshebuildshow.com where you can ask me questions and share with me what you're building.